The Emperor protects. The Lord of Mankind, eternal guardian and unwavering ruler of Imperial space, reigns from the Golden Throne of Terror. He is seen as father, protector, and according to the teachings of the ecclesiarchy and imperial cult, the supreme deity of the entire human race. The forces of chaos and their demonic servants designate him as Anathema, for he stands guardian of cosmic order in the galaxy. For over 10,000 years, his physical shell has remained motionless within the sarcophagus of the Golden Throne, succumbing to the inexorable process of decay. But his spiritual power knows no weariness. The unquenchable power of his soul continues to guard the Imperium, directing the actions of the Psychers, inspiring courage in the great defenders, and protecting humanity from the hidden threats that lurk in the darkness of the universe. The Emperor, once encased in human form, now persists solely by the technology of the Golden Throne and his unparalleled willpower maintained by the daily sacrifice of a thousand psychers. In the heresy's aftermath, the Emperor chose to forfeit his immortal existence for humanity's welfare and protection. Innumerable citizens of the Galactic Empire venerate him as the ultimate deity, ensuring the solidarity that keeps humans as one of the most formidable forces in the Milky Way surpassing other species in population and territorial dominion. Under a consolidated rule, humanity withstands endless perils from Xenos, Chaos forces, and internal adversaries, including heretics and mutants. Post-heresy governance on the Emperor's behalf transitioned to the High Lords of Terror and various regional authorities. This steadfast regime, though often perceived as tyrannical and merciless, is a necessity. Nonetheless, this form of leadership has resulted in technological and cultural stagnation and a descent into despotism. The rise of superstition, religious zealotry and bigotry would likely have dismayed the sovereign himself. Although the emperor can no longer interact with external influences, his presence is crucial for the Imperium's survival. He doesn't partake directly in galactic governance but upholds the Imperium with his ceaseless strength from the Golden Throne. His potent spirit, manifested in the warp, fuels and steers the Astronomicon's beam, essential for faster-than-light travel through an alternate dimension. For over 10,000 years, his corporeal form has been confined within the Golden Throne's sarcophagus, undergoing relentless decay. Yet his spiritual might remains indefatigable. His undying psychic force continues to fortify the Imperium, guiding psychers, emboldening its stalwart protectors, and shielding humanity from the unseen horrors that skulk in the cosmic void. According to a particular hypothesis, the Emperor embodies the collective consciousness of early human psychers, shamans from the Neolithic period, who were reborn into a single entity amidst the unholy realities of the warp. This event occurred before the four immense chaos forces had fully materialized and dates back approximately 8,000 years before the current era in what is now known as Turkey. As humanity evolved, the immaterium influenced by the dark emotions deeply rooted in the collective subconscious began to swell with turmoil. This disturbance led human psychers away from their ability to reincarnate as their souls became prey for the warp's demonic entities upon death. This predicament threatened the extinction of human psionics and without the shaman's guidance, humanity would succumb to chaos's allure, much like the Eldar's eventual fate. Faced with this existential threat, Earth's psychers convened in a monumental council, deliberating salvation from their impending absorption by the Immaterium. They resolved to merge their essences, intending to reincarnate within a singular vessel, a unified consciousness they referred to as the New Man. Following this, a thousand psychers ended their lives with poison, their spiritual energies surging into the Empyrean, a psionic wave incinerating any demon in its path. From this indomitable blaze, a shared soul arose, and a year later, a child destined to become the Emperor was born on Terra. The Emperor's origins trace back to Anatolia, where he was born into a simple community of herders and cultivators, part of a family as typical as any other, with parents, siblings, and a life that was ordinary in all but one aspect. From the embryonic stage, the child exhibited extraordinary capabilities, 
altering his genetic makeup and physical constitution, bestowing upon him immortality and shielding his soul from demonic predations within the immaterium. As he matured, his profound psychic prowess began to surface. For 38,000 Terran years, he traversed the expanses of Earth, initially a silent observer of civilization's triumphs and tribulations. However, compelled by the potential he discerned in humanity, he soon took a more interventionist stance. Drawing upon his age-old wisdom, he disseminated advanced governance structures, agricultural practices, industrial foundations, and tirelessly worked to quell the scourge of war. Throughout these epochs, he operated with discretion, assuming the humble guise of an average individual, never betraying his extraordinary nature. The future emperor was a constant sentinel in humanity's journey, exploring every corner of the world, fostering cultural, religious, and scientific progress wherever he roamed. At times, he adopted different persons, ascending as a revered leader, wise man, or even a savior during critical historical junctures. He has stood as a crusader, spiritual guide, and on rare occasions, a messianic figure. Yet more frequently, he chose to exert his influence from the sidelines, serving as a royal counselor, mystical court figure, or pioneering scholar, always guiding humanity towards its destiny. The emperor, in his myriad disguises, often opted for modest, inconspicuous roles. However, some of his incarnations profoundly influenced historical trajectories and spiritual doctrines. In epochs of dire peril, he steered humanity on a precarious course, known solely to him fostering prosperity. Yet the Empyrean's turmoil escalated relentlessly. Recognizing the nascent Chaos Force's sustenance on humanity's more extreme nature, the future Emperor endeavored to instill peace and equilibrium on ancient Earth. Regrettably, he couldn't expunge inherent human propensities such as ambition, dissent, battle lust, or self-satisfaction. Not all endeavors of this new man bore fruit. Some wisdom seeds either lay dormant or sprouted into grotesque aberrations, spawning ages of strife and warfare. The burgeoning entities of the warp, sensing the stir of one they would later brand anathema, acknowledged his efforts to curb their ascendancy. These malignant immaterial forces, not yet fully sentient, perceived the future emperor as their paramount adversary. The first chaos entity to attain consciousness was Khorne, whose emergence heralded an era of widespread conflict and warfare upon ancient Earth. Following closely was Zainch, under whose influence realms engaged in deceptive political gambits. With the awakening of Nurgle, the third Chaos God, pestilence raged worldwide, reaping countless lives to glorify the nascent Lord of Decay. Each Chaos Lord's rise imprinted on humanity, reflecting their particular aspect of the human psyche and each posed a unique and horrific challenge that the Emperor had to contend with in his long hidden guardianship of mankind. As the European Middle Ages drew to a close on terror, only Slanesh, the fourth Chaos God, remained dormant within the warp, awaiting its eventual awakening by the reckless Eldar race a millennium later. With his psychic prowess growing, the new man, the future Emperor, gained increasingly vivid premonitions of the grave perils facing humanity in the cosmic expanse. He committed himself to vigorously defending his species and guiding it towards a destiny where Terrans would reign supreme in the galaxy. During the waning centuries of the Dark Age of Technology, there was a significant surge in the birth of mutants endowed with the psychogene, granting them access to the formidable energies of the warp. This proliferation of unbridled psychic individuals precipitated catastrophic repercussions, plunging humanity into the bleakness of the Age of Strife. It was in this era of chaos and fragmentation that the future Emperor recognized the necessity for a more direct, overt intervention in human affairs. Following the Eldar's downfall and Slanesh's subsequent emergence at the 30th millennium's close, the tempest that had barred solar system egress and hindered interstellar discourse finally abated. Seizing this pivotal moment, the Emperor resolved to personally steer humanity's course, vowing to salvage the species from the brink of annihilation. 
It's pertinent to note that within the contemporary Warhammer 40,000 lore, the origins of the Master of Mankind remain enigmatic, with scant information available regarding his existence pre-unification. However, there is no contention concerning the Emperor's immortality and unparalleled capabilities. The earliest extant Imperial records referencing the Lord of Humanity date back to the tumultuous final centuries of the Age of Strife, marking his emergence as a pivotal figure in galactic history. However, these accounts merely skim the surface of the myriad theories swirling around the Emperor's genesis. One particular narrative posits that the Master of Mankind first drew breath along the banks of the River Sakaria, within a humble Stone Age hamlet situated on the Anatolian Peninsula, amidst a family of ordinary humans. Tragedy struck early in his life when his father fell victim to fratricide. As the young child engaged in the solemn preparations for his father's archaic interment rites, he was besieged by a vivid, unbidden premonition of the fraternal betrayal. Subsequently, with a demeanor devoid of visible grief or rage, the nascent ruler confronted his uncle. With a mere exertion of his burgeoning kinetic prowess, he stilled his uncle's heart. The Emperor, reflecting upon this pivotal juncture, professed that it was this defining moment that crystallized his understanding of humanity's intrinsic need for structure, legal in the annals of history. It is chronicled that the Emperor triumphed in unifying terror at the close of the 30th millennium. Horus, recounting his inaugural encounter with his progenitor, alludes to the latter's childhood spent in Anatolia. It is unequivocally acknowledged that, even before his enthronement upon the Golden Throne, the Emperor had been an ancient entity, living through countless ages. More than ten millennia prior, the epithet New Man was conferred upon him, recognizing him as the inaugural and most formidable of a nascent human subspecies. He was the singular embodiment of the bygone shamans, sorcerers, and wise men who had once shepherded humanity in Terra's primordial epochs. Throughout his upbringing, the Emperor's consciousness reawakened memories from thousands of past lives, amalgamating this vast reservoir of ancient wisdom with his continually accruing experiences, itty and stewardship, to actualize their full collective potential. After some time, he ventured into what is believed to be the first city established by mankind, likely one of the Sumerian city-states nestled in ancient Mesopotamia. Regardless of the origin story's source, they converge on a singular truth. The individual destined to ascend as the emperor was the paramount psyker amongst his kind. Some accounts hint at his clandestine membership within humanity's perpetuals, Beings endowed with physical immortality attributed to their extraordinarily rapid and efficient cellular regeneration. The nature of this trait, whether a spontaneous mutation or a crafted one, remains obscured. The Emperor's existence, it is said, stretched back to the era of humanity's prior stellar civilization, a period now enshrouded in the annals of history as the Dark Age of Technology. During this epoch, he engaged with entities akin to himself, one of whom was a woman known as Olivia Surika. Together with a cadre of other perpetuals, they embarked on a journey aboard a void-faring vessel to Molek, where they supposedly found a gateway to another dimension, Warp. Thus, the future emperor made his ingress into this realm. Speculation abounds that he entered a covert pact with the shadowy Pantheon, acquiring newfound capabilities and the esoteric knowledge requisite for the genesis of the Primarchs. Upon his re-emergence, he entrusted Sureka with the guardianship of the portals on Molek, anticipating an era when they would fall under the aegis of the burgeoning human empire. Present efforts are dedicated to meticulously sifting through the extant imperial archives, endeavoring to unveil a more intricate chronicle of the Emperor's ascent, commencing with the unification wars that marked the dawn of the 30th millennium. The particulars of the Emperor's elevation and his subsequent Great Crusade are enigmatic, veiled in the mists of time. In the most archaic records where his presence is inscribed, he is depicted as one warlord amongst many, vying for dominion amidst the tumult concluding the Age of Strife. 
This sovereign of humanity, vanquishing his adversaries, orchestrated a succession of martial campaigns, subsequently enshrined in history as the Unification Wars. To harness his strategic acumen to its fullest, the sovereign orchestrated the maneuvers of diverse battalions, comprising warriors whose prowess was enhanced through genetic alchemy. The Geno 52 Chiliad, for example, was one such regiment, which later became part of the Imperial Army. The most powerful of these fighters were the Proto-Astartes, called the Thunder Warriors. They contributed significantly to the Emperor's final victory over the rest of the tyrant rulers. Such success led him to believe that he would need an even more effective army of genetically engineered soldiers and commanders to realize future plans to unite humanity. Following the conflict at Mount Ararat within the realm of Uratu, the conclusive clash in the campaigns across the ancient territories, the Emperor saw his ambition fulfilled. Unity was forged following a decade marred by blood, flames and sacrifice, a pivotal triumph that signified the world's unification, with all its dwellers under the governance of humanity's sovereign. Yet his aspirations extended to cosmic supremacy, encompassing all the fragmented human colonies. He acknowledged that realising such a grand vision necessitated choices of severe, perhaps even unethical, nature. The Thunder Warriors, having served their purpose, posed a threat in a time of peace. Thus the Emperor decreed the extermination of any remaining warriors, paving the path for their successors, the Primarchs and the Legiones Astartes. In the official narrative propagated by the Imperium, all Thunder Warriors met their end valiantly in the fray near Mount Ararat, with the mightiest among them, Arik Taranis, hoisting the Emperor's standard in a final gesture of triumph and unity before succumbing. In truth, the Emperor's endeavour to obliterate these fearsome combatants from the annals of history fell short. During the slaughter, referred to by the Thunder Warriors as the Culling, several evaded their destined demise, among them Arik Taranis, destined to influence the future of the Emperor's realm. Unwavering, the ruler of mankind set forth on his visionary quest to shield and uplift humanity, journeying through the disgraced stars to unify all human strongholds beneath the protective mantle of the emerging Imperium of Man. Venturing into the cosmic unknown, he initiated a monumental campaign, the Great Crusade. In the aftermath of Terra's unification, the Emperor established a division of astro-telepaths, known as astropaths, ensuring psychic interplanetary communication within his forthcoming realm. He proposed constructing the Astronomicon, a potent psychic beacon, energized by his own formidable essence and will. This pioneering navigational aid profoundly enhanced the safety of traversing the vast, unpredictable voids of space. The advent of the Astronomicon also significantly extended the scope of spatial jumps, yet the crowning achievement of the Emperor was the forging of new legions, comprising biologically enhanced superhuman warriors. With Geno soldiers already under his command, the creation of these advanced forces represented a natural progression. Nonetheless, these new contingents vastly outstripped the might of earlier genetically augmented soldiers from Terra's unification wars. In the initial phase, the Emperor embarked on the Primarch project, aspiring to create 20 superior beings, transcending human limitations, their genomes intricately woven with elements of his own genetic code. These Primarchs were not only to be exceptional warriors, but also leaders, guiding their legions in the ambitious galactic campaign. As these extraordinary offspring matured, they evolved into unparalleled strategists and leaders within the Emperor's forces. The Primarchs transcended common humanity, embodying physical and intellectual capacities so profound that no regular human could challenge them. However, the confines of genetic manipulation alone fell short of actualizing the Emperor's vision. Thus, he fortified the Primarchs further by harnessing the arcane energies of the Warp, secrets he had gleaned during his mysterious sojourn on Molech. This infusion of otherworldly power was meant to imbue them with abilities far beyond even what their enhanced genetics could provide, cementing their roles as humanity's ultimate protectors and conquerors. Upon realizing his magnificent creations, the Emperor imbued them with powers and charisma bordering on the divine. However, unknowingly, he also exposed them to potential corruption from the denizens of the Immaterium. 
His grand scheme nearly unraveled when malevolent forces threatened by his ascendancy intervened. These entities, recognizing him as the anathema, feared his complete victory would solidify universal order and diminish the chaos god's power. The exact circumstances that befell the Primarchs remain a matter of speculation and varied accounts. Some sources speak of a catastrophic betrayal, others of a mysterious cosmic upheaval, but all converge on one event. The Primarchs were dispersed throughout the galaxy, torn from terror and their father's guidance. This scattering led to their upbringing in diverse environments, inevitably influencing their future paths and the roles they would play in the impending struggles of the galaxy. Confronted with this profound loss, the Emperor forged a new strategy. He utilized remnants from the Primarch's genetic material to craft a warrior caste, endowing them with superhuman traits reflective of their progenitors and the Emperor himself. These soldiers, known as the Legiones Astartes, or Space Marines, became the spiritual successors to the enhanced warriors of the Unification Wars. Armed with this formidable force, the Emperor marshaled his twenty legions of Space Marines, embarking on their initial campaigns to liberate the solar system and begin the monumental endeavor of reuniting humanity's scattered stars under a single banner. During these early battles, the soldiers honed their martial and diplomatic prowess. Made up entirely of Terra natives, the legions drove out extraterrestrial invaders from the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Their most critical achievement was forging a peace with Mars's cult Mechanicus. This key alliance, affirmed by a binding pact, provided the Emperor with the crucial technology and support necessary for his cosmic crusade, representing a major step in consolidating unity. As the Empire was officially instituted, the roots of Imperial administration were laid on venerable terror. The cult Mechanicus transitioned into the Adeptus Mechanicus, a crucial arm of the emerging Adeptus Terror. With the 30th millennium ending and the warp disturbances from Slaanesh's emergence abating due to the Eldar's downfall, the Emperor launched the Great Crusade. This massive campaign involved myriad expeditionary forces spreading his dominion throughout the stars, reconnecting with isolated human settlements. The Crusade freed humans from alien domination and seized vast realms for the burgeoning Imperium. Yet more crucially, as the Terran fleets delved into cosmic frontiers, the Emperor pursued his dispersed Primarch sons. Found one by one, often years apart, they were reunited with their progenitor and entrusted with legions crafted from their genetic blueprint. These formidable commanders were pivotal in the Imperium's construction. Jointly, they orchestrated the unification of thousands of worlds, solidifying the dominion of humanity's sovereign and imparting the Imperial truth. This ideology, anchored in rationalism and the accomplishments of science and technology, vehemently opposed any form of irrational belief and zealotry, notably religion, the Emperor asserted that humanity's genuine liberation and its ascension to its rightful place as the supreme sentient race in the galaxy would only transpire following the obliteration of the last religious shrine. He is renowned for having expunged all vestiges of ancient religions and mystical beliefs from terror before initiating the crusade. In a demonstrative act of this ideological shift, the Emperor personally ensured the destruction of the final sanctuary on ancient terror. He even engaged in a direct confrontation with the priest residing there, known as Blatter, where they battled not with physical weapons, but with the contrasting doctrines of the imperial truth and the remnants of religious fervor. The emperor also contended that humanity was the rightful heir to the galaxy. Firstly, humans had the cleanest appearance, and secondly, other sentient beings such as the Eldar had proven their incapacity to sustain galaxy-spanning civilizations. It was now humanity's turn to claim their stellar domain. Every alien species encountered had displayed either irredeemable aggression or potential future obstruction to human supremacy and resource exploitation within the galaxy. Thus, any Xenos exhibiting even slight aggression or obstruction to humanity's path were to be eradicated immediately. The Emperor advocated for this principle to be peacefully ingrained within all human societies. He held that without absolute unity, humanity couldn't endure, let alone thrive. 
in the perilous cosmic landscape. If enforcing this unity meant waging war on dissenters who failed to see this imperative, then regrettably, conflict became the only recourse. Reflecting on the unification era, the Emperor grieved for the innocents and the curtailed freedoms that often followed the expeditionary fleet's campaigns. Yet he acknowledged no alternative. This was the singular method to safeguard humanity and undermine the futile might of the Dark Deities. While the Imperial Truth upheld the beacon of logic and scientific pursuit, it enforced an adamant restriction. The conception of sentient machinery was strictly outlawed. Recalling the devastating conflict against the sentient Iron Men robots that contributed to the collapse of humanity's former stellar empire during the Dark Age of Technology, he refused to allow history to repeat itself. Consequently, when the Great Crusade encountered civilizations in the galactic void that relied on artificial intelligence, they were obliterated as prospective menaces to the burgeoning Imperium. Additionally, as the Crusade progressed, apprehension grew regarding the use of psychic powers among humanity's emissaries and combatants. Even the Emperor, the most psychically endowed human ever known, viewed the proliferation of psychic mutations with profound unease. He rightly surmised that a significant portion of humanity hadn't psychically or spiritually matured enough to wield warp energies responsibly or resist the enticements offered by the Empyrean's most wicked denizens. As the Imperial forces continued their galactic conquest, they increasingly encountered worlds subjugated by enigmatic powers and so-called sorcerers, individuals wielding inexplicable abilities. Indeed, these individuals were adherents of the Chaos Cults, wielding powers granted by the demonic entities of the Immaterium in their battles against the Emperor's forces. Notably, their psychic talents bore striking resemblance to the unique capabilities of the Thousand Suns Legion. This similarity didn't go unnoticed, particularly by Mortarion of the Death Guard and Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves, who voiced their criticisms. Mortarion, who had confronted sorcerers on his native world of Barbarus, was intimately aware of the warp's perils. Conversely, Russ, valuing straightforward physical combat, viewed any reliance on deceptive or cunning tactics in battle as inherently dishonorable. To him, the Thousand Suns' delve into forbidden sorcery was an abomination, fueling his vehement advocacy for a complete prohibition of psychic practices within the Imperium. His disdain for what he perceived as dark sorcery was profound, and he campaigned aggressively against the sanctioned use of any psychic abilities. Russ's stance was heavily shaped by first-hand experiences during collaborative missions with Magnus's Legion. The internal division had escalated, jeopardizing the nascent Imperium's cohesion. Consequently, the Emperor convened a monumental council, seeking a definitive resolution. Delegates from opposing factions converged on Nicaea, poised to present their cases before the adjudicating Emperor enthroned in an archaic amphitheatre amidst a vast assembly. Leading the prosecution were the witch hunters, including the enigmatic Sisters of Silence. They recounted a litany of heinous transgressions perpetrated by sorcerers, future servants of the entity, later known during the heresy as Chaos. Their testimonies highlighted abominable mutants forsaken of their humanity, power-lusting individuals exploiting their abilities for nefarious ends, and cult adherents. The gathering was also starkly reminded of the catastrophic havoc wrought by unrestrained or demon-infested psychers during the tumultuous initial epochs of the Age of Discord. The powerful Primarch Magnus the Red took over the protection of the Psy abilities. His presence was awe-inspiring, but when he began to speak, his words held an irresistible power unique to the Emperor's sons. The Scarlet King argued that knowledge could not be inherently evil, and any pursuit of new discoveries was noble if the seeker remained the master of his knowledge, not its slave. Magnus pronounced with confidence that his legion, the Thousand Sons, had fully mastered the mysteries of the Psy disciplines, and for them there is no unknowable. They serve humanity, not seek to enslave it. At the end of his speech, Magnus pleaded with the Emperor not to ban Psy abilities, but to support their development for the good of the Empire. His impassioned speech divided opinion at the Council of Nicaea, despite the strong arguments of the opponents of Psy powers. 
When Magnus finished, the tension was at its peak. The Emperor nodded favorably and silence reigned. Among those present were powerful Astartes psionics supporting Magnus. One of the young epistolarians spoke, comparing psionics to athletes whose talents should be developed, not feared. He argued that psi abilities were not a threat in and of themselves and could be used for both good and evil. However, despite the persuasiveness of their words, the Emperor made a decision that drastically changed the Empire's policy on psi abilities. He banned the use of psi abilities except for those necessary for the functioning of the Empire, such as navigators and astropaths. These individuals were subjected to strict control and training. The Emperor also ordered the Primarchs to disband all Psi structures in their legions and to stop the development of Psi abilities among the Astartes. This decision was prompted not only by the debates at the Council, but also by the Emperor's personal frustration with Magnus, who was found to have continued to engage in forbidden practices, thus violating his father's directives. These events are described in the Heretical Chronicles, and they were a turning point in the history of the Empire. During the Council of Nicaea, psionic warriors in the Space Marines were forbidden to use their psi abilities. The institution of chaplains in the legions was established to maintain faith in Imperial truth and to strengthen resolve and loyalty to the Emperor. The Emperor again ordered Magnus the Red to abandon dangerous practices and cease his quest for knowledge of warp and magic. Magnus the Red was naturally unhappy with this decision and openly spoke out against the decisions of the Council of Nicaea. Nevertheless, he submitted to his father's will and agreed to carry out his instructions, although the future of his legion, the Thousand Sons, was clouded by the cunning of the Dark Gods. Either way, for the next 10,000 Terran years, the Edict of Nicaea remained largely unchanged and set the Empire's policy on matters pertaining to PSI abilities and mutations. The ban on the use of PSI abilities was only lifted after the heresy of Horus, when it became clear that psionics were necessary to fight the forces of chaos. A standard century after the start of the Great Crusade, the Emperor decided to return to the Golden Throne to undertake a unique project to complete his labors for humanity. He was going to use a special artifact from the Dark Age of Technology, the Golden Throne, discovered beneath the sands of Mars. The Emperor needed this device to create the Imperial Web, a network of warp portals that would allow instantaneous travel between the worlds of the Empire. Such a breakthrough would provide an unprecedented increase in scientific and economic development, making travel through the web more efficient than the Empire's current methods of warp travel. Most importantly, humanity could finally rid itself of the pervasive breath of chaos that hung over them like an inexorable cloud. The Emperor sought to realize the web project, which he believed would free humans from the need to rely on the warp, thereby significantly weakening the influence of chaos's destructive forces on reality. Under his leadership, the human race could evolve towards becoming a full-fledged race of psychers, whose accomplishments could eclipse even the greatness of the Eldar. Mastery of the web would be the catalyst for unifying the Imperium, removing the spatial and temporal barriers between its worlds. Such an ambitious project required untold effort on the part of the Emperor and had to be carried out in secrecy so that enemies could not derail it in its initial stages. The key to the web, created during the Dark Age of Technology, was a giant throne-shaped mechanism constructed of a mysterious alloy with gold flecks. This throne was placed over the majestic gateway that was the entrance to the web, wide enough even for a Hound-class Scout Titan to pass through. Originally, this artifact was located in the depths of the Imperial Palace in the place where the Emperor's genetic laboratories were once located and where his red-clad techno-priests conducted their work. They worked tirelessly until the Overlord began operating a portal to the web, opening it to his ministers. Their task was to construct a new corridor in this dimension that would connect to the Eldar's main transportation system, at that point virtually abandoned. Since the web was made of a material inaccessible to the forces of Imperium, and the Imperium did not have the technology to recreate it, the Emperor had to personally protect these human passageways from unwanted intrusion. This obliged him to remain on the Golden Throne at all times, 
which eventually led him to turn over control of the Crusades to his Primarchs and focus on the project. The Emperor made the decision to step back from direct leadership of the war effort after a monumental victory for his troops in one of the largest battles. The Imperium did not face a more serious threat until 10,000 years later, during the Third War of Armageddon. Abandoning the Great Crusade, he handed over command of all military operations to his most gifted and favourite son, Horus, the first of the Primarchs, found on a dying planet so close to Terra that it didn't require warp drive to reach it. Horus, who had been at the Emperor's side the longest, had earned a special respect and trust over many standardised decades that surpassed that of the other Primarchs. At the beginning of the Great Crusade, they had fought shoulder to shoulder as father and son. The Emperor once saved Horus's life during an assault on a hostile world, and Horus repaid the favour during the liberation of another city. The battle in which the Emperor defeated a powerful Orc warlord from the Black Fist clan was particularly memorable, and Horus's legions, known as the Moon Wolves, actively participated in this battle. After such exploits, it was no surprise that the Emperor appointed Horus to lead the crusade in his absence, bestowing upon him the unique title of War Master. The Emperor declared that the time had come for his sons to prove themselves in strategic thinking and military cunning. He organized the Council of Terror, imposed imperial taxes and expanded the power of the civil government and bureaucracy, including the Adeptus Administratum. He then secluded himself in his palace, continuing to work in secret on the Golden Throne and the strategy for invading the Web of Eldar. Success in this would allow humanity to seize control of a portion of this cosmic highway. However, the Emperor did not explain his reasons for withdrawing to Terra and transferring power to the Primarchs, veterans and the aristocracy, which the Primarchs for the most part had neglected. These moves laid the groundwork for future conflicts, especially since the Emperor put Horus in charge of his brothers, effectively forcing them to follow the War Master's edicts. The ambition, pride and jealousy of the Primarchs opened the doors of their souls to the Chaos Gods, warping the minds of many of them and leading to the terrible events of the Horus heresy. These changes caused discontent among many of the Emperor's subjects, especially his genetic heirs. In the ensuing years of the Great Crusade, Horus, the Emperor's most trusted son, fell under the influence of Chaos, but the foundations of his betrayal had been laid decades earlier by the dark forces of Chaos and their minions. Numerous planets throughout the galaxy preserved ancient legends of mystical journeys to sacred places where mortals could meet with divine entities. One such planet was Colchis, home of Lorgar and his 17th Legion, where these beliefs were particularly deep. The possibility of encountering divine entities has proven to be real. Those who venture on such a journey can learn the truth about the universe, the discovery of powerful spirits known as the gods of chaos ruling their realms. His thirst to understand the reality of the deities worshipped on Colchis in the past was the reason for his wanderings. In search of answers, he accompanied by warriors of the Order of the Gathered Sun from the 1301st Crusade Expeditionary Fleet, travelled to the edges of space then known to mankind. At that point he had not yet been enslaved by Chaos, but had already abandoned the idea of the Lord of Men as a deity, which had been brought about by a severe humiliation on Monrachia, 43 years before the Horus heresy began, when the Emperor personally arrived to punish him for his worship. The Emperor, adhering to the principles of the carriers of the word, expressed his frustration at the 17th Legion planting a cult of personality on conquered worlds, which was at odds with the atheistic tenets of imperial truth. Using his psychic powers, the Emperor forced the Primarch to bow down against their wishes, stating that only the 17th Legion had failed him during the campaign. After this incident, they were put under surveillance. The Emperor left a select few warriors behind to monitor their every move and make sure they stayed true to their course. Unable to bear such an insult, and at the urging of his confidants, Lorgar Aurelian decided to go on a pilgrimage. His goal was to determine if the gods of Colchis really existed, and if so, whether they deserved the faith and service of the bearers of the word. 
He is convinced that the Emperor is wrong to reject the natural human desire to believe in the Divine and seeks to find those entities that are truly worth honouring. The Word Bearers have tirelessly sought knowledge of ancient truths and places where the Divine and mortal can merge. This quest led the 1,301st Expeditionary Fleet to a system near the edge of the largest space storm in the universe, later dubbed the Eye of Terror by the Empire. The fleet commander noted the presence of unusual voices emanating from nearby areas of the vast rift in reality, voices that the Primarch realized belonged to demonic entities from the Immaterium. In the Cadia system, Aurelian became convinced that his hunches were correct. The similarity of religious beliefs throughout the galaxy to the ancient cults of Colchis was no coincidence. It confirmed the universal truth of the existence of chaos. He decided to enter orbit around the uncharted planet, designated 1301-12, to and organized an expedition to its surface. The expedition consisted of word bearers, custodians, imperial soldiers and legio cybernetics robots, with Lorgar taking command. They were met on the planet by members of numerous barbarian tribes, According to the evidence, these natives were dressed in primitive clothing and armed with flint-tipped spears, but showed no noticeable fear of the aliens. Significant was the presence of their violet eyes, the color of which was similar to the Eye of Terror. Despite the objections of the custodians who insisted on executing these heathens, the word bearers began a dialogue with the locals. A mysterious woman emerged from the crowd, addressing the Primarch by name and welcoming him to her planet. Her name was Inga Tell, and she was the leader of one of the Chaos Cults. This priestess became Lorgar's guide on the path of spiritual enlightenment, which was effectively the beginning of his slide into heresy. Subsequently, the priestess performed a mystical ritual, transforming herself into the demonic ruler Inga Tell the Exalted. In this new guise, she ascended to the command bridge of the Song of Orpheus, the ship of the 1301st expedition, and pointed the way into the depths of a terrifying cosmic anomaly. The warriors of the Order of the Golden Sun explored ancient worlds inhabited by a variety of creatures, where they encountered relics of the fallen ancient empire. The demon told them of the birth of a dark deity resulting from the intemperance of the Eldar, but withheld the whole story. The demon claimed that the Elder had not passed their probationary period because they had not recognized the primordial truth and worshipped chaos. These beings had spawned a goddess of pleasure, but had not accepted her. When this new deity awakened in the 29th millennium, it realized that its followers had acted out of their ignorance and fear. The echoes of its birth created the Great Eye, an eternal storm reminding of the Eldar treachery. Thus, the word-bearers gained knowledge among the remnants of a luxurious empire. The demon warned them that humanity could only survive if it avoided the mistakes of the Eldar and turned to chaos. The surviving warriors of the Order of the Jagged Sun returned to Cadia and recounted their discoveries and adventures in the Eye of Terror. Lorgar then ordered the planet to be bombarded with cyclone torpedoes. He decided to wipe out all traces of life so that the mystery of chaos would remain only with him. But the planet was strategically important, and later the Imperium sent colonists there. These settlers became the ancestors of the modern Kedians. Over time, they developed violet eyes like the first inhabitants, possibly due to exposure to the Eye of Terror. This experience profoundly changed Lorgar and the Word Bearers, revealing to them the power of chaos. They gradually succumbed to its influence and became its servants. In their hearts, they had already betrayed the Emperor. Therefore, in the last years of the Great Crusade, they tried to enlighten humanity by telling them about the real nature of the universe. Over time, they began to use deception and intrigue to serve the Dark Gods and recruit other Primarchs. One of their major accomplishments was the betrayal of Horus. When it became clear that humanity would not accept chaos without violence, they decided to free it from the false teachings of the Emperor. Primarch Aurelian enlisted the help of Erebus, the first captain of the 17th Legion, and helped organize the Horus heresy. 
When they encountered the highly advanced race of the Interrex, Erebus stole from them the Anathema, a sword infused with the power of chaos. Later, Horus and his legion reached the moon planet Davin to quell a rebellion organized against the Imperium by the former governor, Yugan Temba, to whom the tainted sword Anathema had been given. The first chaplain gave Yugan the task of wounding Horus with this cursed weapon, previously used against the servants of the infected governor. As a result, the satellite became a place of evil, inhabited by terrifying creatures like black zombies. These unpeaceful dead, formerly soldiers of the Imperial Army, posed a host of problems for the Legion. In a climactic battle on the command bridge of a destroyed Imperium spaceship, one of the sinister creatures managed to strike Horus with anathema. The poison invented by the Lord of the Plague began to flow through his veins, proving so powerful that even the Primarch's enhanced immune system could not resist. Ereb then announced that Horus could only be saved in the Serpent God's temple. In desperation, the Moon Wolves handed their creator over to the Servants of Chaos. During a ritual called healing, Horus's soul was sent into subspace to meet demonic forces. The Lords of Chaos discovered the seeds of ambition and envy in his soul, upon which they based the vision showing how the Emperor had supposedly abandoned the Great Crusade and returned to terror to become a deity, betraying his sons and his promise to free humanity from religious shackles. The irony was that such a future could only be realized with Horus's betrayal. However, the Primarch believed the vision, determined to save the Imperium from such a fate. Turning against his father, he accepted the help of Chaos. Under his leadership, nearly half of the legions of the Adeptus Astartes turned to the dark side, and Horus led them on a campaign to terror. His actions launched a massive civil war in the young Galactic Imperium, beginning with treachery on Istvan III and Istvan V. This conflict, later called the Horus Heresy, became the bloodiest in human history. Billions died as the treasonous legions destroyed the Imperium they had once created. The conflict peaked at the Battle of Terror, when the armies of Chaos attempted to take the Imperial Palace. Throughout the heresy, the Emperor was bound to the Golden Throne, unable to leave it. At the beginning of the conflict, Magnus the Red broke through the palace defences in violation of the Edict of Nicaea, attempting to warn the Emperor of Horus's treachery. But the Emperor refused to believe in the treason of his beloved son. The Emperor believed that Magnus had succumbed to chaos by continuing his illegal use of Psi powers. He instructed Lehman and his Space Wolves to arrest the Scarlet King and bring him to terror for trial. However, Horus twisted this order, causing the Space Wolves to defeat the Thousand Suns minions on their home planet. This forced Magnus's warriors and Magnus himself to turn to the Dark God Zinch for protection. Magnus used a powerful spell to break through the Psi barriers of the Imperial Palace, causing severe damage to the Astronomicon project. Demons burst through the weakened Psi shields of the Emperor, attacking the mechanics and Sisters of Silence working on the Imperial Labyrinth. The Custodians, led by Constantine Valdor, engaged in battle with the forces of Chaos, attempting to break through from the portal beneath the Golden Throne. Though the Imperials stopped the invasion, only the Emperor could keep the portal closed, holding back the demons in the human portion of the warp. Preoccupied with this crisis, the Emperor assigned Rogel Dorn to lead the fight against the rebellion. He also held a psychic dialogue with Malkador, who predicted the end of the heresy and the injuries the Emperor would receive from Horus. In these conversations, the Emperor admitted that he had foreseen his fate and accepted it as punishment for his mistakes. Later, Korax, demanding an audience with the Emperor, arrived at the palace, mourning the loss of his legion. The Emperor, fighting the rebellion and holding the warp portal, shared with Korax the secrets of creating the Astartes. Korax attempted to rebuild his legion, but betrayal by Alpharius's agents thwarted those plans. The Raven Guard remained the splintered legion, having little effect on the outcome of the heresy. The Emperor continued to sit on the Golden Throne, protecting the Imperium from the demons of the Warp. Five years later, after Magnus's actions, the Emperor began to show signs of fatigue. His burden was getting heavier, and even the Custodians saw his suffering. 
At that moment, the powerful demon Drachnian appeared in the warp. Recognizing the approaching critical moment in the warp, the Emperor ordered the Sisters of Silence to gather a thousand psychers from across the galaxy and hook them up to the Golden Throne. Their lives were sacrificed in a single day, allowing the Emperor to personally intervene in the warp, saving the retreating forces of the Imperium from the formless horrors of that dimension. He defeated the demon Drachnian, trapping him in the body of the custodian Ra Endymion, and ordered the custodian to flee deep into the labyrinth, providing protection from the demon. In the end, the Emperor needed to seal the portals to the chaotic warp world, once again becoming the prisoner of the Golden Throne. With a heavy heart, he announced that his ambitious project, the Imperial Web created for safe travel through the warp, had been destroyed. Humanity now awaited the fate of the Eldar, slow extinction under the pressure of chaos. The Emperor foresaw his own end at the hands of his son and the rise of another traitorous Primarch to the role of Chaos War Master, who would continue the campaign to destroy humanity. He bitterly recognized before the custodian Diocletian Chorus that the Imperium, the symbol of human will and might, was doomed, whether its struggle lasted a year or ten millennia. The Emperor recognized that even he did not possess the answer to saving humanity from its imminent fall. The culmination of the heresy came seven years after the betrayal began, when the traitorous forces laid siege to terror. Bound to the Golden Throne, the Emperor could only leave it for moments, when he was replaced by the loyal Malkador. Realizing that the shield on Horus's flagship was down, the Emperor realized the final battle was coming. He decided to answer the challenge, seeking to end the war in one decisive blow. Leaving Malkador to rule the Golden Throne and defend the Imperium from the threats of the Warp, he personally led a detachment of Astartes against the traitor's army. In the final, fateful act of the Horus Heresy, the space around Terra became the scene of cosmic tragedy. The Emperor of Mankind, the greatest being ever to tread the Earth, led squads of Imperial Fists and Blood Angels in a desperate boarding party of the Spirit of Vengeance, a flagship desecrated and warped by the dark forces of chaos. Beside it, like a steely guardian, stood Rogel Dawn. But Horus, Lord of War, filled with dark magic and treachery, distorted the teleportation streams, scattering the loyalists across the menacing maze of his fortress ship. The first to confront Horus was Sanguinius, the noble lord of the Blood Angels. In an epic duel full of rage and despair, Sanguinius fell, but his final act was a blow that left its mark on Horus. And then, amidst the chaos of battle and the echoes of betrayal, the Emperor himself entered. He was the embodiment of incomparable power, a beacon in the psychic darkness, but before him stood Horus, now a monster reborn through the sinister patronage of the Chaos Gods, who had become their true champion. Thus, two titans, symbols of order and chaos, humanity and madness, clashed in a fateful confrontation. Horus inflicted horrific wounds on the Emperor, destroyed his arm, slashed his throat, destroyed his body from within. He could do this because the love for his son still flowed in the Emperor's heart, keeping him from unleashing the full might of his psi powers, even in the face of the need for extreme sacrifice. And in that moment of apocalyptic combat, when all seemed lost, a lone warrior burst onto the bridge. At that fateful moment, when the fate of the galaxy hung in the balance, one of the Legio Custodes broke through the chaos of battle to become the last defender of his lord. Horus, now nothing more than a puppet in the hands of Chaos, with disgust and cruelty, destroyed the faithful guardian with a single demonic glance, unleashing infernal relics before him. This act of soulless cruelty was the final straw for the Emperor. He saw that the son who had once been his pride was now mired in darkness, a mere instrument of destruction in the hands of Chaos. Realizing that Horus's power over the galaxy would lead to an era of untold suffering and darkness, the Emperor gathered his wits. The sacrifice of Custodius gave him a moment, a brief pause in the storm of battle necessary to gather his strength and strike the decisive blow. With ruthless determination, the Emperor focused the full immense power of his divine mind, 
unleashing a smashing blast of psychic energy that pierced even Horus's reinforced Terminator armor. This blow didn't just destroy the Warlord's body, it erased his soul from the very fabric of reality, preventing any attempt by Chaos to resurrect him. In his final moments of existence, Horus, whose soul had been enslaved and mutilated by Chaos, experienced a fleeting awakening. In that brief moment of clarity, he saw the horror of his deeds and felt gratitude to his father for freeing him from his eternal slavery to the Dark Gods. His consciousness, freed from the chains of Chaos, dissipated into the infinite warp, leaving behind only a pale glow. The Emperor, gravely injured, was found by Rogel Dorn, his loyal son and Primarch of the Imperial Fists. Dawn discovered his father, the Emperor, bathed in blood and grievously wounded. He transported the Emperor to the palace, where, it is said, Malkador the Sigilite, having stepped off the Golden Throne, simply turned to dust. The Regent had expended all his physical and mental reserves to keep the portal to the webway sealed until the return of the Master of Mankind with a spirit of vengeance and to provide the Emperor the strength to ascend the throne. In his dying moments, the Emperor swiftly instructed how the Golden Throne should be reconfigured to transform it into a sophisticated, life-sustaining device capable of maintaining the Emperor's ravaged body on the brink of death for millennia. After the necessary modifications, he was placed within this updated version of the device aided by the mechanisms of the throne. The Emperor could also sustain the Astronomicon's beacon and combat the influence of the Dark Gods. For this, his mind required daily nourishment of psychic energy from the sacrifice of a thousand psychers. Thanks to these sacrifices, the Master of Mankind continued to maintain the barrier against the demons attempting to breach from the webway and to resist the taint of chaos throughout the galaxy. The Emperor rapidly weakened and before the Adeptus Mechanicus activated the systems of the modified throne, he managed to give one final brief set of instructions. He was then placed in a continuous stasis, which has persisted for over 10,000 years. Only the consciousness of the Master of Mankind remains active in the Materium, while his lifeless body slowly decays, ensnared by the throne's intricate machinery. These events, embodied in the sacred texts and beliefs of the Imperium cult, have become the foundation of the spirituality of the Imperium, approved in the 32nd millennium as the official religion guiding the faith of billions. With each sunset, the lives of thousands of psychers fade, their essences drying up, sustaining the Emperor's endless vigil on the Golden Throne. In the depths of space, the black ships sail across the stars like messengers of death, gathering psychers doomed to sacred sacrifice. Adepts of the Administratum, guardians of this grim lot, seek them out across the galaxy, luring them with promises of service to the God Emperor. Their lives a necessary payment for the safety of billions. Those who refuse to accept their fate are led to believe that their existence is a threat to all around them, and only through sacrifice will they find redemption. If persuasion fails, their will is broken, binding them to machines that brutally drain their life force to maintain the Emperor's eternal vigil. The Emperor, imprisoned in his golden mausoleum, is tormented with endless agony, longing for the rest he so desperately needs. But his unbreakable will, his boundless love for humanity, keeps him on this agonizing path. He is the last bulwark standing between order and chaos. If he dies, the light of the Astronomicon will fade, and ships roaming the warp will be lost in darkness, left to the mercy of the formless horrors. Without his light-giving presence, the Imperium would collapse into chaos, torn by internal conflict and civil war. This unyielding dependence on its life force, this desperate desire to keep it alive in this world, became the basis of an unwavering belief in its divinity. This credo upheld by the Imperial cult is a beacon to the billions of souls wandering among the stars. In the heart of the Imperium, among its myriad legions, only the Space Marines guard the Emperor's true will, rejecting the blind religiosity that has enveloped the galaxy. They remember him as the great conquistador and architect of humanity, but do not submit to the idolatrous cult that has repeatedly caused clashes with the dogmatic ecclesiarchy and the ruthless inquisition. 
But at the end of the 41st millennium, the galaxy trembled, engulfed by chaos on the greatest scale since the Horus heresy. Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade rained down upon the stars, Cadia fell, and the Great Rift opened, dividing the heavens. But in this age of despair, a star of hope has flared again. Robout Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, has returned. Rescued from a thousand years of anabiosis by the magic and ancient technology of Archmage Cole, he has risen to lead his people once more. Gilliman, the last of the Emperor's sons, arrived on Terra where, through the ages, he met his father. What happened between them is shrouded in mystery. But the world has seen Gilliman, reborn and strengthened, assume the mantle of Lord Commander, becoming the protector and guide of humanity in its darkest hour. In his hands now is the Sword of the Emperor, a sacred weapon of bygone eras, holding a spark of divine power that has been preserved in the shrines of Mars since the betrayal. With this sword, a symbol of power and hope, Gilliman enters the Age of Indomitus, leading the Imperium through the Great Night or Noctis Eterna, confronting all that threatens the human race. Across the starry expanse, Robout Gilliman led a new crusade, led by the mighty Primaris, a new generation of warriors created to combat the threats besetting humanity. At the same time, the cosmos was illuminated by the appearance of saints, whose strength and will seemed to be directed by the Emperor himself. Among them was a young man, whose psychic aura became a beacon for the stars, and a girl like an angel, who with her voice could dispel darkness, dry up demons, and inspire hope in despairing hearts. But shadows of doubt and fear crept into the hearts of the faithful, for at the sunset of M41, the guardians of ancient technology, the Adeptus Mechanicus, stood before the High Lords of Terror with a terrifying revelation. The Golden Throne, the majestic mechanism that sustains the life of the Emperor, is cracking. The knowledge needed to restore it has been lost in the sands of time, and unless a miracle occurs, the light that has kept the predatory teeth of chaos in darkness for so long will be extinguished forever. Fate, ironically, had turned against the Emperor, the great educator who had sought to free his children from the chains of ignorance and superstition. Now he himself became an object of worship, the embodiment of the divine in the eyes of those he sought to liberate. Lorgarus Aurelianus, even before the heresy broke out, had proclaimed his divinity in his Lectitio Divinitatus, anticipating the cult that would surround his name and turn him into an icon of the faith he so rejected. The Lectitio Divinitatus declared that only a divine being could unite the countless worlds of humanity under a single banner, spreading his power across the boundless expanse of stars. No mortal could possess such extraordinary wisdom, boundless compassion for his brothers and sisters, or astounding knowledge that revealed the secrets of the universe. The Lorgar doctrine resonated in the hearts of many, and cults exalting the Emperor to divine status began to form even before the Great Crusades were over. They looked to Lectitio Divinitatus as a sacred text, taking inspiration from its words and naming their faith after the work. Despite this, the imperial authorities viewed such teachings with distrust, deeming them heresy and subjecting adherents to severe repression. Lorgar eventually rejected his teachings and turned to the dark gods of chaos, but his words had already sprouted like seeds in the hearts of millions. In the age of the Horus heresy, faith in the emperor became a fortress and a light to many, a source of strength to resist the darkness enveloping the galaxy. This sincere reverence gave the defenders of humanity the power to resist the demonic forces of chaos. Centuries later, the scope of this worship expanded, and by the 38th millennium, numerous sects came together to form the Imperial cult, which rose to the status of the dominant religion in the Imperium, an ever-burning star in the dark expanse of human history. Once the cult of the Emperor was officially established as the state religion by the High Lords of Terror, the spiritual needs of the masses were placed upon the shoulders of the mighty Ecclesiarchy known as the Ecclesiarchy, or more formally, the Adeptus Ministorum. He who had once been a mere worldly ruler was now revered as the God Emperor, the only true deity of humanity. His will was interpreted and enforced by the High Lords, 
His laws were upheld and enforced by the Adeptus Arbites. His physical body and imperial palace were guarded by the custodians. The Inquisition, founded by his decree at the time of the Horus Heresy, grew into a powerful and autonomous agency, standing guard over the Imperium against threats from within and without. Although the Emperor strictly forbade the cult of personality during his lifetime, the belief of billions in his divinity gave him unparalleled psychic power. This was possible because the collective beliefs and subconscious desires of the vast human race are reflected in the warp, affecting the very fabric of reality. As the Ecclesiarchy states, the Emperor's imprisonment in the Golden Throne was not a defeat, but rather a triumph. His majestic spirit, freed from physical shackles, ascended into the warp to directly protect and lead his subjects. This is why the symbolism of the Imperium so often includes the image of a skull, symbolizing the Emperor's self-sacrifice for his people, regardless of their past. Now the Emperor has shone in the full measure of his divine majesty, becoming a force equal to even the mighty deities of chaos. His power is so great that he arguably rivals the combined might of all the dark gods, standing guard over cosmic order in our galaxy. Even in his current state as a powerful spirit rather than a living being, the Lord of Humanity continues to mysteriously communicate his will to select psychers through the mystical cards of the Imperial Tarot. Moreover, he establishes direct contact with his devoted servants, even those who do not possess psi powers but carry an unbreakable faith in their hearts, granting them visions and guidance in dreams. This sacred alliance is also a shield that protects humans from the vicious forces of chaos and its demonic servants. The Emperor is believed to have the ability to influence the material world in the most amazing ways. Many believers are convinced that the etheric storm that erupted in the Ultima segment, known as the Storm of the Emperor's Wrath during the Age of Apostasia in the 36th millennium, was nothing more than a manifestation of his omnipotent will. It is the belief of many that his anger was caused by the usurpation of power by the despotic High Lord Gorg Vander. It is also believed that the Emperor's incredible power in the Immaterium is the last bastion against the onslaught of Chaos. If his sacred spirit leaves the Golden Throne, Chaos will break into our world, turning the entire galaxy into a nightmarish realm of madness like the Eye of Terror and only a few of the highest echelons of the Inquisition know that within the sacred walls of the throne room, the Emperor has the power to directly manipulate reality itself, dominating time in the most unimaginable ways. In eternal agony, the God Emperor suffers, chained to his throne, powerless to express his horror at the degradation of the Great Imperium. For ten millennia, his majestic creation has failed to heal the wounds caused by heresy, chaos, alien threats, mutations, and betrayal from within. The centuries that should have been the golden age of humanity, the dream of the Overlord uniting his children, turned into an age of darkness. The Imperium, a fortress among the stars, is gaining stability. But at the cost of technological decline, mental stagnation, brutal repression, exploitation of the masses, insane xenophobia, and fanatical religious zeal. All those darknesses against which he rebelled have now intensified in his name, distorting his grand vision. But even in his tortured existence, he perseveres, fearing that without his eternal light, humanity will be consumed by darkness. Despite the rot that has engulfed his Imperium, he must survive. In rare moments of divine intervention, the Emperor guides the hand of his ministers, trying to bring a modicum of light into the lives of his subjects. He holds out a spark of hope while the shadows of the end times thicken and the vital mechanisms of the Golden Throne falter like a heart beating its last beats. This section covers topics whose canonicity is shrouded in a fog of doubt, leading to controversy and conjecture. One of these is the Eldar belief in a possible incarnation of the divine Inead, Lord of the Dead. According to the beliefs of these ancient Xenos, a mysterious deity will rise in the network of their world ships from the moment the last Elder fall, giving way in the physical world. Today the Inquisition ruthlessly condemns the doctrine of the Star Child as a heresy born of the cult of the pure birth. But the truth may be hidden behind the veil of mysticism. This hypothesis is built on two pillars of assumptions. The first is the belief that the soul of the master of mankind, crossing the boundaries of the Immaterium, 
will give rise to a new being, the Star Child, the forerunner of the future Emperor. The second statement concerns the direct bloodline of the Emperor, born during the 50,000 years of his existence, during which he, as legends say, founded many dynasties and left behind many descendants. His sons, heirs to fragments of his immortal genome, lack his majestic power, while his daughters, possessing awesome psi gifts, are often heralds of the future. If the Emperor was the galaxy's greatest psyker, his sons are blanks or zeros, hidden from psychic vision and immune to magical powers. There is a secret brotherhood in the depths of the Imperium known as the Illuminati, who have knowledge of the Emperor's descendants and the slowly fading flame of his life despite all attempts to keep the machinery of the Golden Throne alive. These keepers of secrets know the story of the fall of the Elder and the birth of the Shadow God Slanesh, and may hold the key to the salvation or death of all mankind. The Illuminati mysterious guardians of forgotten knowledge struggle against the inevitable catastrophe whose shadows once consumed the Elder. They are well aware that if humanity succumbs to the destructive temptations of chaos, a new fifth unholy force of chaos may be born in the Immaterium. Its birth will tear the veils between worlds, plunging the galaxy into the chaos of psi storms reminiscent of the horrors of the Age of Discord. Hidden amongst humanity's star travelers are unique souls who have resisted demonic influence using only the power of their spirit. These chosen ones, known as Sensei, carry the blood of the Emperor within them. The Illuminati, following an ancient call, find them, revealing to them the veil of the mystery of their origins and uniting them to fulfill a grand design. At the culmination of this cosmic ritual, when the physical shell of the Emperor on the Golden Throne is depleted to the point of exhaustion, the Sensei will sacrifice themselves, pouring their life force back into the Source. This action will ignite the Phoenix Fire of the Emperor's rebirth, allowing him to rise up and once again stand at the head of his Empire, free from the shackles of the Golden Throne. According to Illuminati beliefs, after the tragic battle in which Horus dealt the Emperor a fatal blow, the spiritual and physical beginnings of the Overlord were severed. His soul, stripped of its familiar shell, drifted into the Immaterium, leaving behind only a pale echo of his once majestic being, wandering aimlessly in the chaos of the warp. But if even a spark of his divine power still lingers, there is a chance that he may reincarnate and rise in the material world as a new incarnation. The ancient scrolls of the Illuminators contain the tale of the tragic rift that befell the Lord of Mankind after a treacherous blow from the Rebel in a fateful battle that divided him into spiritual and physical beings. His immortal soul, now only a pale reflection of his former power, dissolved into the boundless streams of Immaterium, leaving behind only a spark of divinity. This spark, like a ship in a stormy sea, wandered through the waves of chaos, struggling for survival in the merciless waters of space. But if even an echo of its greatness survives, there is hope for its full rebirth through a new incarnation. It will be an echo of the ancient ritual of the shamans when they merged their souls into unity. The Emperor's death may spark a new salvation for humanity, perhaps in the distant future when the prayers and faith of billions will strengthen the remaining peace of his soul, rekindling the flame of life within it. Those who took on the heavy burden of ruling the Imperium after the heresy of Horus could not fathom the true purpose of their Lord. His body rests peacefully in the sarcophagus of the Golden Throne, while his majestic mind continues to glow, becoming a beacon for countless souls wandering the vastness of the Imperium, awaiting perhaps their rebirth into a new divine power. The Star Child is said to be the crystallization of the purest love and compassion lost to the Emperor at the moment of his sacrifice. When he gave up that part of himself, gaining the resolve necessary to destroy the soul of his beloved son, the Primarch Horus. The Holy Inquisition have always been at odds with these concepts, condemning them as heresy and blasphemy that threaten the spiritual integrity of the Imperium. In the year 997, M41, Inquisitor Cortez, joining forces with Alexis and Credo, crushed the Temple of the Star Child on the planet of Livorno IV, denouncing the followers as devotees of dark forces. 
From that point on, the warriors of the Holy Throne began to view any mention of the cult of the Star Child as heresy, led by servants of the Lord of Change who seek to lead the faithful astray from the path of true faith. It is interesting to note that the Inquisition's arsenal includes devices, such as hacking grenades, capable of disabling targets using rare negative energies derived from residue regularly removed from the Golden Throne. There are other ways to obtain such energy, such as from recycled Psyker bodies. It's worth mentioning that the idea of the Star Child was once part of the main plot of Warhammer 40,000, but it was later recognized as heretical, replaced by less certain stories of ancient conflicts and technological disasters. However, there are still those among the upper classes who believe in the possibility of the Emperor's return. These devoted servants claim that the spirit of the Overlord can be transferred into the body of a Chosen One, who will become his new incarnation. The secret designs maturing in the mind of the Emperor and the pages of history that will be written in the coming eras remain a mystery. We can only marvel and admire this unique, memorable image in a science fiction world that combines the myths, gothic motifs and heroic pathos that make up the essence of the Warhammer 40,000 universe.